session, uh, will uh, will show you how, in an academic setup, uh, we try to do translational medicine uh, and how we can start with concept and how we can take them uh, to uh, uh, in vitro, in vivo clinical trial, and hopefully at the end to back to uh, the patient uh, via the big market. And um, uh, I'm, I'm not going to talk only about cancer research. I'm going to talk about uh, various aspects of people that look after cancer patients. Um, next slide, please. Uh, so I'm going to start to talk about surgical devices. Uh, that would be a surprise for many of you that are very focused uh, in chemotherapy or cancer research. Uh, then I'm going to talk about endoscopic devices. Uh, and then I'm going to skip pancreatic cancer, but I'm going to talk about drug research and therapy for liver cancer, uh, which is very much complementary uh, to uh, and come in the right time after the uh, presentation uh, of, uh, of the excellent presentation of the first speaker. And this really represents uh, the, the life of physician and surgeon that look after cancer patient because every cancer patient might end up having surgery, endoscopy and chemotherapy. Next slide, please. So I work in this hospital uh, called Hammersmith Hospital, which is part of Imperial College. It's a very famous hospital in particular for translation and medicine and research. And um, next, please. Next slide. Yeah. So I'm going to start with a device uh, that I, I dreamed about. And then I went to the engineers in the Faculty of Engineering of Imperial College. And then they did for me that device. Next slide, please. And if you press on the video so that it starts working. You, 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 you will find the video. Uh, uh, yeah, it's coming now. So this is essentially, uh, uh, a, a, it show you uh, a, a diagram where, for example, a liver cancer is present there and you want to take it out and you want to avoid bleeding. And this is a device I have invented um, called Habib 4X. Um, and then as a surgeon only cut in the area where there has been radio frequency ablation and in actual fact, you can get it without any uh, bleeding uh, and there is no need uh, for blood transfusion. Next slide, please. Just a moment, uh, Dr. Habib, just a moment. So this is, uh, it just show you and I, you know, how uh, a, a surgeon can work with an engineer uh, inside the university and come up with a device. And then you try it uh, in a in living animal and if it works, uh, then you apply for the ethical committee. Uh, and, then, uh, and then you start uh, 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 trying it all around the world. Then, and it's very good for me to say this is a good device, but what matters most is what other people think. And this is a, a paper from uh, California. And you can see at the bottom there, the Habibo X is safe to, to use uh, for blood loss, blood transfusion, and marginal accounts. Next slide, please. This is another one from Florida. And, uh, uh, and there, um, uh, they say that it is simple, safe, and indicated in patients that have liver failure, they have high mild scores. These are the difficult patients to do. Next slide, please. And then we used it in Imperial College, 
And there are, uh, every year, there are a list of, uh, of the mortality, the results after liver resection all over the UK. And you can see all the large centers in the UK here in, on the map. This is called Dr. Foster. And you can see that the, our center, Imperial College, has the lowest uh, number of patients that died uh, after liver resection. Uh, so it shows that the device uh, is safe and, and is competitive compared to the rest of the UK. Next slide, please. And this is a, a nice study uh, that came from China where they used it and they compared the results uh, uh, comparing the uh, what's called the CC cash clamp technique. This is the classical way to do liver resection or using the Habib works. And essentially they show that there is nearly double uh, survival uh, when you use the device because you are removing all the tumor and you are inducing inflammation so that you can get the immune system uh, in that area where the tumor was in order to sterilize the tumor bed. Next slide, please. Next. Next. And, and, and this is results from Guangzhou uh, in south of China. And they, uh, they have shown better survival uh, when you use that device. Next. And essentially, because you, you cause inflammation, necrosis from the RFA, and you bring in the immune system. Next slide, please. And I was lucky to take that device and go around the world. In actual fact, I operated in many sites in Russia, China, um, and 20, I operated in 20 different cities uh, in China. And, and that it was all around collaboration, academic collaboration. Uh, next, please. And the company uh, sold it around the world, and, uh, the, and th there has been $41 million uh, that came back to the university uh, because of the sale of that device. Next. And this money was uh, invested to do the same, to develop a, a device in endoscopy, to allow the endoscopist when they do ERCP to go in the common bile duct and do radiation uh, to the cholangiocarcinoma and pancreatic cancer in patients that are not suitable for surgery. Next. Yeah, so this slide show results of the use of this device in patients with cholangiocarcinoma. Uh, and the first, uh, the first series uh, was in patients treated in Boston, uh, Harvard, uh, and, and in New York, and they showed statistically significant improved survival in patients with cholangiocarcinoma and pancreatic cancer in, uh, when the device was used. Then in the second, uh, in the third series, this is our series at Imperial College, which we show improved survival. And in the, in the last one in red, this is a Chinese series coming from Shanghai. Shanghai has the largest a hospital in the world, the Oriental Liver Hospital. And they did a randomized study and they showed statistically significant uh, survival uh, using that device. Next, please. And uh, essentially how you can tell is that uh, we, did, uh, we did a radio frequency before we do an operation called Whipple to remove the head of pancreas. And then we cut across, next slide please. And you, you can, and this slide gives away the reason is that after the ab ablation, the RF ablation, there are a lot of CDA T cells that come to clear up all the necrosis that was caused from the radio frequency. And we believe that this is the reason why there is improved survival uh, 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 following the use of RF ablation. Next slide, please. And, uh, 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 and when the results were, uh, were shown in multiple series that it improved survival, then uh, one of the largest uh, device company called Boston Scientific uh, 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 acquired the device from Imperial College and they are uh, distributing around the world. 
And in actual fact, this year, it got the uh, Edison Prize for innovation. Next. And this is an example how a, 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 a crazy idea or a concept in an academic milieu, uh, you can, because of your friends uh, that help you, and uh, you can develop it with very little money. Uh, you, you don't need to raise millions and millions of, of pounds. Uh, with very little money, you can take it into clinical trial. And then when you clinical trial that is successful, then big pharma come and take it. And when big pharma come and take it, then it goes around the world. And this is all about impact. How from within uh, your hospital, you can have an impact around the world. Now I'm gonna uh, move, shift on to uh, uh, away from surgery and endoscopy into drug development. And we have been developing a drug uh, for uh, liver cancer. Next. So uh, this slide actually, uh, it's from, uh, 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 I, uh, uh, there was Ira Menman uh, making a presentation in Beijing uh, in October 2018, and I took that picture. It's very beautiful because it shows you how the macrophages are actually uh, de uh, uh, destroying the T cell. So my, our macrophages, our immune system is there to protect us from infection and from cancer. But in cancer, uh, when cancer develops, it's actually the opposite happens, is that they attack the immune system. Next slide, please. And in another, in another uh, 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 lecture uh, by Takwa, uh, it was he he he, uh, he 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 showed that picture. Uh, he called, like the tumor is like a citadel, like a palace, like a castle, and surrounded by a wall. Uh, and that wall are the macrophages, and outside are the T cells. The killer T cell, they try to get into the castle to kill the, the tumor, but the macrophages stop the T cell from uh, attacking uh, uh, the tumor cell. Next, please. And this is about uh, what is a tumor? Tumor is, is not just cancer cell. Um, in actual fact, there are myeloid cells, there are cancer associated fibroblasts, there are T cells. And in some tumors, like, like pancreatic cancer, more than 50% of the tumor are myeloid cell. There are more myeloid than tumor cell. Uh, so we have developed a system um, that will uh, target the myeloid cell uh, as well as the cancer-associated fibroblast. Next, please. And so, um, so essentially, we try to uh, to, in, uh, to target uh, the, the the white blood cell, and 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 the, the graph on the left show you that if you give our drug, and you count the next day, and you count the neutrophil, well, the neutrophil will double uh, after the injection, and then the following day it start coming down, and by the end of the week it's down to the baseline. Now, if we move to the right side. You give a second injection a week later, the same thing happened. Mitrophil will go up and then down and up and down. One patient had 150 injections over three years, and the same thing happened. It's a reversible mitrophil increase, which is fantastic because whenever you use chemotherapy, a patient gets neutropenia. Here, this drug doesn't cause neutropenia. Actually, it does the reverse. Next, please. This is a slide um, on a patient uh, with liver cancer. And if you focus on the lower uh, bottom uh, row, on the left-hand side, there is a tumor there, uh, 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 and it is in segment eight. And then after two, uh, week seven is half the size. And then week 16 uh, is very small now, it's down by 70%. And it stayed like that for uh, uh, more than two years. And uh, this patient was treated in London and uh, with hepatitis B. Uh, next, please. Uh, 
we, we skip that one. I have a better one. Yeah. Yeah. And this is my best slide. This patient, if we, let, let's let's look on the uh, top uh, on the left. In November 2017, had two months of our drug. And you can see there are 10 lung metastases. All these uh, small nodules in the lung, and both on the left and the right, there were also peritoneal metastases. There was also a, a primary liver cancer. And then after receiving our drug, then patient takes rafinib. So rafinib uh, doesn't do complete response. Actually, it's, uh, it, it, it's, it's not known to do complete response. And you can see all the tumor have disappeared. And last November 2017, we are December 2020, three years and one month. That patient has no recurrence, and that patient haven't received any treatment whatsoever for the last two years. And this shows you the, the combination effect of a drug that modulates the myeloid cell but the, and, and has little effect on tumor killing. But then you come afterwards and you use the tyrosine kinase inhibitor, even a drug that is off patent uh, and a magnificent effect. Uh, next slide, please. That's uh, uh, again uh, another picture uh, showing you uh, how um, how the lung metastases uh, have disappeared, and the primary tumor in the liver um, um, had radio frequency uh, before the therapy, but it was still there, but it disappeared. It's not vascular uh, anymore. Next, please. Right, so let's let's focus on this slide. Let's go for the top line. At zero months at the start, um, we stained for macrophages, the M2 polarized macrophages, with a staining for CD163 positive. And you can see a lot of green cells there. These are the M2 polarized macrophages. Then the patient had our drug for two months. And then a, a second biopsy from the tumor. There are no more macrophages. They have gone. Now let's move to the lower lower row. Um, uh, patient, the CT scan shows there are still a lot of lung metastasis. So although our drug made the M2 polarized macrophage disappear, the tumor is still there in the lung. There were no change on the clinical tissue because our drug doesn't kill the tumor, but it prepared for the killing. It prepared for something to come after, for example, like tyrosine kinase inhibitor. And then you give the sorafenib for two months and bingo, all the tumor disappear. And this is a sequence of events. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and I can tell you that this uh, happen in so many patients that about one third of the patient with hepatitis B and hepatitis C get uh, either complete response or durable uh, partial response. Next slide, please. And this comes to, uh, this is an academic slide. Uh, what we use here in the university is that you have a patient that doesn't do well and you are there at the top there at 12 o'clock. And you get, especially with surgeon, when we lose a patient and we are upset because the patient died. And then uh, suddenly we think about a, a crazy idea, a dream. Uh, and and then uh, and then then we, we think it's possible that it can be true. So we put a patent at 11 o'clock. At 10 o'clock, after you put a patent, you publish it, and you have to publish it because you need money 
uh, and with publication, you can apply for grant. Nine o'clock, you apply for grant. And with the money, you get the prototype uh, for uh, you know, uh, 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 the, the machine with the engineers. And then you do an experiment on a piece of meat on the bench, for example. Uh, and then you take it to an animal uh, in vivo. You, you see whether it works in larger animals. And if it does, you go to the ethical committee to, up, uh, to apply for uh, uh, authorization to do the clinical trial in your hospital. And then, uh, then if it is successful, in the UK, we go to MHRA, the Medicine Health Regulatory Authority. And this is like the FDA, our Chinese FDA. And, uh, and then we go to get a CE mark in Europe or FDA approval. And then uh, in the UK, we put something called NICE, which is uh, uh, for, uh, 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 this is a national body to give opinion. And then you as a doctor, you cannot go and, and, and sell it. You need a, a big company to go and market it and sell it. And this is what we did is that in the end, the, the university uh, uh, gave the license to uh, a, a, a multinational company to market and sell it in a device, which makes that every time uh, we operate a patient here at the Hammersmith Hospital, there are 10 or 100 patients being uh, operated elsewhere in the world using uh, the same device. And this, we call it clinical translation. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much. Uh, Professor Habib, for a, a very nice um, presentation. Um, if I may, I'll, I'll, I'll start with a question of my own. So uh, in terms of, of biomarker for best response for your small molecules, um, what do you think that would be um, in terms of discriminating with patients that would not respond versus patients that would? Uh, excellent question. Um, as you know, there are no real biomarker for liver cancer for a long time, apart from alpha fetoprotein. Um, so uh, it, this is a difficult area. However, uh, from clinical observation, we, we know that it works on hepatitis B and hepatitis C, and it does not work on NASH uh, because hepatitis B and hepatitis C have a lot of myeloid cells. The myeloid derived suppressor cell, NDSC, and patients have it in the liver before even the, uh, they get cancer. So you have something to work on. Now, when you go to NASH, for example, uh, they don't go through the classical way where the first decade there is inflammation, the second decade liver cirrhosis, the third decade cancer. They, they jump as they go from uh, hepatitis straight to liver cancer. It's a very aggressive tumor. Uh, and and there is no MDSC, so there is nothing for our work, our drug to work. However, uh, we hope that by looking on the num on the uh, amount of macrophages uh, 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 and monocyte uh, in the liver on the tumor biopsy, uh, we can classify the patient into those that will respond and those that will not respond. In actual fact, those that will respond have a lot of macrophages uh, on the tumor biopsy. And those that have, have regressive disease have none. It is like an all or none all. It's so dramatic. It's not 20% and 60%. It is either it's full or none. Uh, and so we are, we, we just started the clinical trial again. And this time we are doing it in combination with uh, anti-PD-1, uh, and we already have seen really nice data uh, in patients that usually are resistant uh, to PEMRO, uh, uh, such as ovarian cancer uh, and a mesocidioma. And this is ongoing. Uh, and, uh, um, and we are starting a, 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 a second, uh, second study, um, a phase two for specific for liver cancer, where we are developing a, a companion diagnostic to see whether by looking on the tumor biopsy before treatment, we can predict uh, the outcome of the therapy. Okay, 
Very nice. Thank you.